Alrighty, whoever sequenced these talks did a great job because I think there's one slide on causality I can actually leave out. Um, <laughs> Okay. Um, so it, it's really a pleasure for me to be presenting this work because it's actually some work that I did uh, uh, about eight years ago when I was finishing up my PhD thesis and you know, I went off and started a job at IBM and always meant to publish it but never really had a chance to get back to it because you know, I really moved on to some other things. Um, but when I saw the call for papers for this workshop, it, it looked so relevant to the work that we had done and you know, it was presented at my defense. and been out there in my dissertation, but who reads dissertations, right? Um, so if you can indulge me for a minute, I'm just going to, you know, like Marty McFly, travel back in time to 2004 just for a moment to help me dredge up the memories of this work. Um, so if we try to think for a second about what was going on back in 2004, uh, so, you know, that was back when, when Mark Zuckerberg launched Facebook. You know, I, I for one can't really remember what life was like before Facebook. Um, it was also the year that infamously Janet Jackson suffered from her wardrobe malfunction during the Super Bowl. Uh, so who can, who can forget that? But then it was also a year when an incumbent president was being challenged in an election year from a politician from Massachusetts. So I guess, you know, there, there are some things that, that never change. Uh, and if you think about it, uh, you know, as far as Time travel goes, you know, coming from a programmer, uh, dealing with relaxed synchronization is probably as close to time travel as we're going to get, right? So you're, you're a programmer that's doing a read of some variable. You know, when you do that read, are you going to get the old value or are you going to get the value that's being currently written by some concurrent reader that's kind of in the future with respect to the way it would work in a, a properly synchronized program? Um, in other words, you're going to get the value that you expect or, or are you going to get some sort of a wardrobe malfunction? Uh, so, without any, uh, so get, getting down to the point, um, you know, what, what the perspective that we're coming from here is really from the perspective of hardware developers who have an existing system with an existing system architecture. Uh, we're not going to modify it. Um, we've got, you know, legacy code bases that we're trying to run and trying to run efficiently. And we want them to scale as well as uh, you guys do in terms of uh, building you know, aggressive software mechanisms for, for achieving that scalability. Um, so we're, we're trying to ask ourselves is what if we want to apply the same, the same source of principle, uh, but the lever we have to use is actually the coherence protocol implementation, you know, in hardware. Um, so, you know, how can we go about optimizing this? And uh, what, what we're going to describe here today is a protocol that we call edge chasing delayed consistency, uh, which allows each core to continue usually using a stale version of a cache line. You know, it's stale because some other core in the system has invalidated it. Uh, it's going to allow that core to keep using it until it's absolutely necessary, where necessary is defined by you know, the constraints of the consistency model. Uh, for this work, it's a power, power architecture weekly ordered model. Um, and you know, we want to see you know, what happens. Do we, do we get better performance? Um, so let's see. I think you know, I don't really have to motivate this, this, uh, you know, the existence of and importance of shared memory. And as we've you know, seen today, the kind of coherence traffic is a major source of performance degradation for, for many applications. Uh, so with the applications that we were studying in this time frame, uh, we had a set of scientific applications, the splash, splash benchmarks from Stanford, but also a set of commercial benchmarks, spec JWB 2000, spec web 99, TPCB, TPCH. So what this experiment was, was you know, running these applications on a full system simulator uh, where each core uh, had a 16 megabyte L3 cache and just measuring, you know, the number of misses per thousand instructions for these benchmarks and, you know, dividing that set of misses into the causes of the misses. Uh, so, you know, in addition to your coherence misses, there's also capacity misses, conflict misses, calls, and, and upgrade misses. The only point here is just that, you know, coherence misses, you know, these are the misses that are caused by the invalidations of your line from another core in the system. Uh, we're a significant fraction for really all these workloads and, of course, the the commercial workloads are really the cases where you see, uh, you know, the frequency of those misses being much, much more severe. So the protocol we're going to be talking about is called edge chasing delayed consistency. Um, like I said, it's a, it's a new hardware implementation of the power weakly ordered memory model. It's not a new pro programming interface, interface for programmers. And it's, it's really striving to get to the necessary conditions of the model. In other words, only uh, forcing uh, communication to happen 
when it's absolutely necessary. Um, and of course, you know, when you start talking about sufficient conditions versus necessary conditions, you want to be precise in the way that, uh, you know, the, 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 your, your definitions, right? So um, what we've been relying on is a uh, formalism called the constraint graph, which uh, was introduced for sequential consistency uh, back at ISCA 18. And I think there's probably similar formalisms that might have been around longer. Um, but it's a directed graph uh, that represents a multi-threaded execution where each node in the graph corresponds to a dynamic construction instance. Um, and there's edges in the graph that represent the ordering, the necessary ordering of those instructions. So for example, you've got program order, which you know, you'll have edges between all the instructions um, executed by an, any single core. But then you also have dependence orders when there is communication. So read after write dependencies, write after write dependencies, write after read dependencies. Uh, so Landon et al. defined this for sequential consistency, and we extended that um, uh, to, to weak ordering. And just a quick example here. So you've got two processors in the system. Um, processor 1 does a store of A followed by a store of B. The memory barrier in the middle, that would be, you know, sync instruction on power. Um, processor 2 is loading the same locations in the reverse order uh, with a memory barrier. Um, so, uh, you know, in the constraint graph representation, you know, the, all the operations executed by a single processor, under sequential consistency, they would all be ordered. Uh, in a weakly ordered model, model, it would just be the operations that precede the memory barrier would be ordered before the memory barrier, and the operations after the memory barrier would be ordered with respect to the memory, memory barrier. And there's also some, some extra edges in there for, you know, data dependencies on within each processor, but uh, that, that, this is just a, a simple example. Um, but then let's say that you've got a, a, a system that, you know, say processor 2 is an out-of-order processor, it's doing these operations out of order. Uh, so here in the blue boxes is just the sequence in terms of time that these operations are happening. It might voice this load of A such that when that store of A finally happens by processor 1, there's that right after read dependence order. Um, and later, let's say the store of B, you know, the processor 1 does a store of A followed by the memory barrier followed by the store of B. And subsequently, processor 2 finally gets around to doing its load of B, and it observes the new value from the store of B, right? So uh, obviously, this is an incorrect execution because you can't place these operations in a total order. You know, and the key thing about the constraint graph is that um, if there's a cycle in the graph, then the execution is incorrect because they can't be in a total order, whereas if there is no cycle, then you know that's correct. Um, so what we were looking to build was an, an aggressive coherence protocol that ignores coherence messages Unless doing so, we'll, we'll create a cycle on the graph. So the name edge chasing actually comes from a, uh, the distributed database literature where there have been, um, you know, let's say you've got a bunch of processors that are executing transactions and you would like to avoid deadlock, right? So there's, you know, one way is you would just try to, you have protocols for avoiding deadlock. Is an, another way is you actually just let deadlock occur and you detect it when it happens. So let's say processor one is waiting on uh, some lock that was held by processor two. Processor two is waiting on a lock by processor three and so on and so forth until you end up in the cyclic, uh, you know, this, this, uh, they're all waiting on each other, right? It's a deadlock. And the way these protocols work is that when some watchdog timer goes off at one of the, one of the cores that's been waiting too long, uh, it creates what's called a probe message and it circulates that probe message to uh, the, the, the thread that it's waiting on. And that, in turn, propagates that to the thread that it's waiting on. And then if this probe message ever makes it back to the original, original originating core, then you know you got a problem. These are database transactions. So you have the ability to abort your transaction. And you retry, and you avoid deadlock that way. Um, so you, you detect the cycle and the waits for a graph. Uh, when, when the, the, the transaction that creates the probe sees, observes that probe again. And this is actually the way that our, our protocol is going to work. Um, so we're going to detect cycles in the constraint graph really the same way. Um, so, you know, ordinarily when a processor does a write, it has to acquire coherent permission for that write. And that's, that's not going to change. So we're still going to assume an invalidation-based coherence protocol. It's going to send its invalidates out to other processors in the system, 
But when it has a right and miss, it's going to create you know, a probe, which you can think of as just being a unique identifier. And it's going to attach that identifier to the message. And when it gets received over at the recipient cache, where there, there might be some locally uh, cached copy of the data, uh, it's, it's actually not going to invalidate the line. It's just going to remember that it saw this message and it will associate that probe with this cache line. Um, and then, let's say subsequently, the core that, of it, that, that originally created that probe message, you know, it's, it's doing other, it, it goes on, it does other communication with other processors. When it does that communication, it's going to keep attaching its probe set to those messages such that, um, you know, eventually, you know, those cores that are caching the stale data, when they actually become causally dependent upon that, that data, that, you know, that, that will happen and they will recognize that when they receive the probe message that's associated with the line in their cache. So just a quick example of this. Uh, here you've got, you know, processor one that does, you know, load A, load B, load A. Let's say at, at, at the first point in time, line A is actually already valid in processor one's cache, and processor two, uh, it's going to do a write, and that's, there's going to be a write after read dependency here that um, when that's going to actually cause an invalidation message to go out to the other processors in the system. And when that happens, processor two is going to create a probe. And, you know, I'm, I'm speaking you know, in the abstract here, and, and you, know, the, you know, I don't have time today, but, you know, we had kind of... Uh, simplified hardware mechanisms that allowed us to approximate the actual passing of these probes around in terms of a, a, a hardware implementation. Um, but so when this, or when this invalidation goes out, it creates this probe. The processor one is going to keep track of that probe and, uh, and the metadata associated with line A and its cache. Um, later, when processor two is going to do the store of memory location B that's going to be read by processor one, that, that read after write dependency is going to happen. You know, processor one is going to have to get that new value from processor two. So when that happens, that's the opportunity for processor two to pass this probe along. And uh, when it observes this probe that's already in its cache associated with line A, that's when it knows it can no longer continue to use the stale value of that data. So in this particular example, when it does this read, it wouldn't be able to use that value. But you can imagine the other cases where that communication didn't happen, it was able to perfectly well continue using that, that data, right? So does a probe have to have enough information to say any which lines of the cache might be stale? Are there not many bits in the probe, is there a cache line? You can, you can just think of the probe as being a unique identifier, and it's associated with one or more cache lines, which are then dependent upon that probe. So you can think of every cache line in your cache having some extra metadata, or maybe not every cache line, but you might have a, a smaller cache off to the side that keeps track of those lines in your cache that have probes associated with them. Probes could go further than cache bandwidth. When you say go further... More, more, more bandwidth. They, they are you know, a piece of metadata that get attached to the invalidates, but then also on subsequent communications, they continue to get passed along, that's right. So in terms of performance evaluation, we were using you know, a full system simulator that had a cycle mode model that simulates out of order power PC <coughs> based cores um, with, you know, pretty just, you know, at the time, I'd say representative cache hierarchies and a Snoopy-based Snoopy coherence protocol. Um, and we evaluated this thing with uh, a few different applications. We had a, a lock-free list insertion with microbenchmark, um, but then we also had some full applications with Flash 2 and the commercial benchmarks that I mentioned before. Um, but before going into all the performance data, um, just to give ourselves some intuition for why we would expect this to be beneficial, is, you know, at least in our system, we were dealing with cache lines that are 128 bytes, so there's the well-known fall sharing problem. There's also uh, the, the concept of silent sharing, where the processor might be doing a store that's actually storing the same value that's already there, and that generates traffic and you know the, the coherence network without actually communicating any new values. Um, and there's also the sorts of convergent or database tolerant algorithms that I think you know there's been a lot of discussion about today. 
and then uh, lock, lock free parallel link data structures, um, which Phil's presentation was a good, good uh, description of. And let's see, uh, Phil probably described this pretty well, but just to reiterate, so you can have a lock free algorithm that's trying to insert a node into a list where you don't actually have to acquire a lock to do that. Um, so, you know, you, when you, you, so let's say you allocate a new node, you want to insert it in the list, you make its pointer point to you know, the next location in the list where it's going to be inserted, and then with a single uh, you know, compare and swap or re-modify right atomic operation, uh, you update that pointer to point to the new entry. So, uh, let's see, obviously there's been, there has been quite a lot of work in the delay consistency um, area. I'm not going to go through all these in, in, in detail, but I'd be happy to, to talk offline if people are interested. Um, in terms of performance, uh, at least for a, a pretty simple lock-free uh, list insertion microbenchmark, it does actually do pretty well. And, and let me tell you a little bit about the benchmark. So this is based on the ha hazard pointer lock-free list uh, algorithm Mag and Michael did back in Posi in 2002. The benchmark is actually is this modeling a 16 core system. So you've got 16 threads. 15 of those threads are randomly updating or searching a random spot in the length list um, and where the percentage of updates is a function that's, that's varied here on the x-axis. And then you've got one thread that's actually doing searches on the length list and so the microbenchmark is actually measuring the latency of doing those searches. Um, and you know, what, what you can see is that uh, we do actually scale significantly better since the, the thread that's doing the searches isn't actually, you know, every time it does a search, it doesn't actually have to go out and get the newest copy of the linked list. It can see if the object that it's looking for is in the list. Uh, and of course, there are maybe concurrent updates that won't be seen, but they are concurrent, therefore, it's not absolutely necessary for them to see those updates, the, the thread doing the search. Now, with this graph, this graph is a little busy. Uh, this actually goes through, um, you know, there's four bars for, per application. The leftmost is the baseline. You know, this is a, the conventional coherence protocol. Just pay attention to the next line over, you know, for example, this one, which is kind of the abstract uh, protocol, whereas the other two are showing, you know, if you had more realistic hardware assumptions with the performance that you were able to get. And what, what we ended up seeing was, you know, and, and, and this is actually just showing the reduction in load misses, and we're categorizing that reduction in terms of the false sharing category, true sharing, which is, uh, were lines that we consider to be potential data, which are lines that we hadn't touched with a, a, a large or sticks, you know, an atomic operation before. Then there are lines that we consider to be potential synchronization, and I, I, something I left out before. When we, you know, we have a couple of, of uh, mechanisms that are used to detect um, locks, for example, things that we think should not be delayed. So, for example, let's say you have a, a barrier. If you if you observe multiple accesses to the same location in a row um, by the same PC, this sort of spinning, uh, this sort of spinning behavior, then we force the uh, Sorry, we've, we, we, we've, we immediately go out and issue a request for that line instead of just, say, spinning and observing the old version of the law. Um, but the, the gist of this data is showing that, you know, we do actually see a reduction in cache misses. Maybe it's not as, as much as we had expected. Um, but, you know, most of that reduction, at least for, for PPCH and for SpecWeb99, is coming due to a decrease in this blue bar. This is the false, false sharing portion of the bar. Um, uh, whereas for ray trace, it, it comes from a combination of <coughs> false sharing, but also from a combination of the potential synchronization lines. If you want to take any questions, you have to quit right now and take them. Okay. Uh, any, any, question, any pressing questions? Otherwise, maybe we can. Yeah, so the conclusion is that in terms of the absolute effect on performance, we got to a bit of a benefit on TPCH and SpecWeb 99, but most of it came from false sharing. Um, with the nine application study, we got a performance improvement for two. In the other applications, either there weren't enough coherence misses or the avoidance of those misses actually didn't improve performance. And you know, we really believe that, that this result generalizes, generalizes to lock-based programs where you're always going to be updating some variable 
um, while holding a lock. And if you are forced to observe the lock, then you're going to be forced to observe the data that was updated. You know, other programming models may have potential, like lock-free data structures. Um, but uh, you know, uh, Hans mentioned you know data races are the source of all evil. You, know, you might consider an axis of evil here, where <laughs> Don Don Donald Newth described premature it's optimization as also being a, an Your evil, right? Up. So, I'm sorry. All righty. I'd be happy to talk more offline with people. Thank you. Thank you very much.